Hello, people on the internet. Hello, Mr. Department. I love the idea of these lightning lessons, the little mini PDs that we're going to do at the um, start of our meetings to help us get some professional development that matters and get some ideas flowing through the department. That's a great idea. Um, my mindset often has me teaching in 52 and 75 minute chunks. And so I'm not really sure I can get passionate about something and keep it under 15 minutes. Because of that, I wanted to go ahead and pre-record mine and stick it into Teams, emails, YouTubes, all kinds of digital spaces for all kinds of digital faces. So thank you for joining me today. And I want to talk about something that I am passionate about. Um, just kind of a quick rundown. I'm an alumni of Gaston College. My associate arts degree is very meaningful to me as an instructor and as a scholar. I went on from here to Belmont Abbey, then Gardner-Webb, then East Carolina and um, Brigham Young and Chapel Hill, and eventually wound up um, after some post-grad work, I wound up in a PhD program at Indiana University of Pennsylvania, which is where the story is really going to pick up in a moment, in a basement of a library, as good stories should. But before we get into that, I want to point out that Gaston College was a great place for me because it allowed me to take a lot of background education. I was four, here for four years taking uh, my two-year degree, had everything from cultural anthropology to zoology. Um, it was just a great time to learn everything. I was very happy that I could take English 111, 112, and 114. 113 was not offered at the time, and not yet, um, before 113 came and then obviously went. Um, but I had 112 and 114. I also had every literature class offered except for Southern literature. So I had American Lit, one and two, British Lit, one and two, World Lit, Women's Studies, African American Lit. I had creative writing. I had everything but Southern literature because I could not find anyone to do an independent study with me on Southern literature. And when classes weren't making back then, um, you could sweet talk a professor into doing independent study with you if you're bright, willing, and brought biscuits. Um, so I learned a lot sitting at the knees of um, people that went on to be my colleagues eventually, which was really lovely. And given the time period, um, my education was shot straight out of the canon, right? Um, the literary canon was still in full effect. The idea of the works worth teaching was still the dominant framing of a class. I had plenty of instructors here at Gaston College and beyond that did add to the canon, did add to new voices, clearly in women's studies, that happened clearly. In African American literature, uh, that happened. Um, but it was a very canon heavy sort of education, but a good education. And I'm happy I, I had it. Um, Belmont Abbey, also a great school. A um, lot of professors bringing in new works, but we did have a great books class, which were still the great books represented from the canon. Great books class was required of all students back then. You had to take great books one and two, no matter what your major was, because they thought that the great works and literature were important across all disciplines. Imagine that. Hashtag all humanities matter. We can make that trend later, right? So uh, I missed Elizabeth Stuart Phelps until I was in a PhD program and found her accidentally. Um, she was not part of the literary canon as it was shaped and given to me as a student, um, even with the additions that I had along the way. She and I met each other in the basement of a library. I was working on a PhD level class on plays, American literature um, and, and plays. I wanted to find a closet drama that had not been discussed a thousand times. I was looking for a work that someone had not written papers about. And so I was going through the basement and the archives. I'm going through literary magazines from you know the early days of, of the Americas and trying to find a closet drama that had been published in a magazine that had not had five articles written about it. I wanted something new. And that's when I found Elizabeth Stewart Phelps. She does have a play um, that we're not going to mention at the moment, too much detail, that probably does need more critical attention. But she is far from being an unknown author. Elizabeth Stewart Phelps, if you're not familiar, um, is contemporary roughly to Harriet Beecher Stowe and Mark Twain on your American literature timeline. And I'm sure that you know that Harriet Beecher Stowe actually outsold Mark Twain. Mark Twain made more money on the oral presentation circuit and reciting his works to people than he did publishing the books because the literacy rate was low. Harriet Beecher Stowe sold really well in America and super well in Europe. And so she actually outsold Mark Twain. Um, Elizabeth Stewart Phelps also outsold Mark Twain. Did not quite have the international numbers and international reach um, of... Uh, 
Harriet Beecher Stowe. Um, I think I'm about to argue that she has as big a contribution to our society as Harriet Beecher Stowe and probably bigger than Mark Twain, even though she was not taught for a very long time, which is why I think she's worth mentioning here. Um, she was a Puritan from a Puritan family from the Northeast of America. Um, you sometimes find her in literature books when you do find her now under Elizabeth Stuart Phelps, which is her name that she published under, or Elizabeth Stuart Phelps Ward, because her husband, you know, Mr. Ward, names get attached there legally. Her husband, her father, her brothers were all um, Puritan ministers, as was a, as a tradition. They had a very specific Puritanical version of Christianity that they taught, and Elizabeth Stuart Phelps disagreed which is an interesting position for one to be in and to be vocal about and to publish and to be a hugely successful author. Um, she has quite a few works. Her one play, one closet drama play has not been explored enough, but we're not going to talk about today. I do want to talk about some of the other works that she has that you might um, want to read, some of the other books that she has. So let's kind of work through our rudimentary tiles here. I want to highlight Dr. Zay. Dr. Zay is probably her second most important novel, um, may be the most fun to read. Now, that's a subjective statement, I'm sure. But Dr. Zay is about a female doctor in a small town that does not want a female doctor. They only begrudgingly use her services and her education because they have no other options. And they are very clear about that in the onset of that book. Um, if you remember the old TV show, Dr. Quinn, Medicine Woman, it's that story but in New England versus the Western frontier. But in a New England, it is very much the Western frontier of this generation. So you've got a um, beautiful young woman as our heroine, heroine is our protagonist, and she is the fount of knowledge, education, and then she's up against society, which poses its own kind of problems. Great read. Um, has a little bit of Jane Austen kind of feel, but not completely kind of situate you and what that feels like. So I highly recommend Dr. Zay. It's a fun read. It's a great read. Very well written. Um, it is very popular for a lot of reasons. Not discussed as a great literary work anymore, which is sad, and it should be. The other work that I want to highlight is The Gates Ajar. Um, this work sold really well, but it also has the biggest impact on society. So the Gates Ajar, the story is a little bit less developed and a little less um, entwined versus something like Dr. Zay or her other novels. But what happens in the Gates Ajar is where she just does not hold back and you absolutely see exactly where she disagrees with the Puritan ideas. Um, her other books have coded hints and veiled messages that you would need to be steeped in the culture and the history to fully appreciate and then to be able to explain to somebody and then have them, yeah, perhaps. Now, The Gates Ajar, a little bit more um, removed from its time and its place, a little bit different reading experience, but what's really important here is what she changes about Christianity in her cult time, um, or what she proposes to change because she disagrees, okay? One concept that she wants to, um, to change is that everyone can go to heaven. That is not a Puritan belief, but that is something Elizabeth Stuart Phelps firmly believed in, that everyone had the shot of going to heaven. It was not your good works. It um, was a, a salvation, redemption, you know, debt is paid by Christ sort of situation, but everyone had the opportunity to go to heaven, and Elizabeth Stuart Phelps is advocating for that. Um, there is some recurring imagery, obviously the gates of jar. There's some recurring imagery of the mortal hand lifting up and pointing to heaven because the mortal spirit wants to go to heaven. And there's some imagery of the divine hand, personified God, Holy Spirit, Jesus, reaching down to take the pointing hand. Um, there's also a lot of imagery about um, the vase, the urn, which goes on to symbolize the body and the spirit, but having the shroud pulled back. And that shroud pulled back is a very important image because, again, it's your body leaving this world going through the veil into heaven and moving past those barriers. One of those barriers is, of course, the Puritan religion itself. Um, so it's a great, powerful work by a powerful woman. And I think that it needs to be discussed more. Um, particularly, you need to be looking at it if you plan to visit cemeteries. If you want to have a nice walk through cemeteries and realize that everything can be read 
Um, one of the reasons I will absolutely advocate that the Gates of Jar and Phelps has as big of an impact as Harriet Beecher Stowe and a bigger impact than Mark Twain is because she basically gives us the idea that everyone gets to go to heaven that a lot of Christianity has now embraced. A lot of Protestant ideas, a lot of Catholics, a lot of Christianity has come to that idea through her. And you can see that it's from her specifically because the imagery that we've mentioned that's in that book winds up in the funeral rites. You start seeing it on tombstones and graveyards. Here's an example from 1974. Um, at the bottom of that tombstone, there's a Masonic image, but the top of it is the gates ajar itself. You see the sailor going into the sky, the sailor image of going into heaven um, through that ajar gate, everyone had access. That's directly taken from her title, and it would be seen in funeral rites after her book becomes popular, it starts having an impact in the way funeral rites are done, and you can actually see it carved into stone still today. So if you walk through a cemetery that has some older headstones, you'll start to see images from her novel carved into those headstones as the community starts embracing what she wrote. Um, of course, you have the Gates of Jar. You also have the images of the hands, Come back here. You have the images of the fingers pointing up, the urns with the drapery being pulled away. A lot of the images that are central to that metaphysical work are absolutely carved into stone. So I think that Elizabeth Stuart Phelps has a huge impact into American culture. She needs to be talked about more in American literature, one particularly. Um, she fits into that kind of weird time period where she can slide her into the end of one or the beginning of two if you just want to include her. She's not always adequately covered in the Norton, the Bedford, or any of the other anthologies. Surprise, surprise. So you may, uh, as you move into thinking about OER literature texts, you may want to start thinking about will Elizabeth Stuart Phelps fit your course or not? And I sincerely hope she does. If she doesn't, I sincerely hope you take some time and read some Elizabeth Stuart Phelps if you have not. Um, I would guess that most of you have not. Um, I would love to hear about your time reading Elizabeth Stuart Phelps. I have not read her works in quite a few years now. I'm probably due for a reread. The works that I would go back to are Dr. Zay, The Gates Ajar, and ultimately this play that I still need to write an essay about. I wrote one for college. I wasn't satisfied with it. Made an A on it, but I wasn't satisfied with the essay. I always wanted to make it better before I published it, and I just never went back. You know how it goes. Uh, maybe one day I'll publish and send that off to a conference and then later publish it. That'd be good. But until then, Gates Ajar, Elizabeth Stuart Phelps' um, Dr. Zay. Her other books are great. Those are the two that I think are the entry point into her. If you want a good story or you want to kind of consider Christianity, Elizabeth Stuart Phelps can do that with you. So thank you for taking time. Let me do a little lightning presentation that I hope was 15 minutes, but it probably wasn't. It definitely wasn't an hour, so good for me. I'm going to breathe now. Have a good day.